The deal is done, but the impact is yet to be known until tonight. It's Sound Month in Review time with Joel Conley of the PI, Mike Seeley of the Weekly, right here on Public Exposure. I'm Stan Emmert. Mike, Joel, welcome. Good evening. Okay, Good evening. so you guys are going to explain everything that happened. Of course we are. Okay, so, the, but the one thing that I, I just want everybody to know, this is not a show about basketball. Uh, what we're talking about tonight is, is the impact, the overall impact, and, and it does have impacts beyond just basketball, right? Of course it does, especially on the merchants of Lower Queen Anne, or so they say. That's a neighborhood that, that I used to live in that's never really come into his own except when the Sonics are around, and it has a true purpose. But now, what's the point? Well, this is a time when sports writers, whether they're local or are on the national scene, have actually kind of come and, and said some things that are common sense. So I want to go to ESPN.com, an article today, uh, and the uh, headline on the article is, Careful Sports Fans, You Could Be the Next Seattle. No graphics. We don't have any graphics yet, so I'm gonna, just going to read you this quote. It says that the Sonics didn't leave Seattle because of a lack of fan support. The loyalists in this city have supported the club through the highs and lows that every franchise goes through, and even some lows that every franchise go through, like when a carpet-bagging owner is deliberately trying to put an awful product on the floor. I want to focus in on that last product yeah. or that last statement was there a carpet bagging owner that was trying to put an awful product on the floor I think the city had a very strong case going into the trial to uh, to make this argument but the city I'm gonna mix sports here because remember many of us in the Northwest have seen football games in which Washington State University goes into the fourth quarter looking pretty good with a decent lead and so on and then there are a series of um, inexplicable bloopers in which they the common phrase is they coog it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the city cooged it with an expert witness that plagiarized himself with a mayor who confessed to having been on a game, one game in 10 years, a super lawyer who uh, signed an oath of confidentiality after meeting with an NBA officials and then blabbed to a local ownership group the next day, thereby creating a major opening that a very clever attorney for the Sonics went, you know, used to go through. So that I think the, I think the city, um, the city's performance during the lawsuit um, is extraordinary in its, in its sheer ineptitude. Can I continue with the sports analogy? Go really ahead. Quickly? Uh, I think the city played a marvelous third quarter, but I'd also argue that they basically sat the first half out, and that's another way of saying there was much too little, far too late from politicians at every level, and frankly, you know, the likes of Steve Ballmer, who, whose intentions were wonderful, but way too late in the game. And whose attentions were not adequate. Yeah, ultimately you're right. Intentions wonderful, not enough attention. Mm -hmm. All right, careful sports fans, you could be the next Seattle. The Sonics didn't leave because they never had success here. They won six division titles and they reached the finals three times and brought home the title in 1979. So they didn't leave because of a lack of success. You know, albeit the last couple of years weren't great. Every team goes through those type of growing pains, but the Sonics were a very, very, very good team as recently as, what, 2004? Yeah. And as early as when Bill Russell coached them, uh, David Brewster in the, uh, in the weekly had a, uh, had a line, the Sonics matter. They mattered when Bill Russell was the coach, and the uh, playoff games were of such intensity that the hated Rick Barry of the Warriors had to be restrained from going after a, a sassy woman fan in the stands. They certainly counted when Lady Wilkins led us to the one world championship that Seattle has had. Um, the region was rooting for them when crazy George Carl was the coach. I can remember going over to uh, raft the um, Hell's Canyon of the Snake River in Idaho, and we went through the little town of Riggins, and there's a hot springs near there. Uh, George Carl bought the hot springs and had all of the Sonics soaking there immediately at the end of the season to try to bond them to go the last step to the championship the next year. And people were talking Sonics in Riggins, Idaho. They mattered. Hmm. Continuing on with the article, careful sports fans, you could be the next Seattle. The Sonics didn't leave because the city never gave them a modern arena. Remember, the remodeled key arena just opened in the fall of 1995. It wasn't that old. 
It was a great place to see a basketball game, too, which I think is also noted in the ESPN yes, article. The sight is. lines are fantastic. There really isn't a bad seat in the key arena. Unless you're over 5 foot 10. I, I guess I'll, so. I'll argue yeah. with you on that one. So. <laughs> but, um, you know, the depressing thing to me about the NBA's business model or what they consider to be, you know, adequate for an arena um, is that it's so different from where Major League Baseball has gone with, with its feelings on the same matter. Now Major League Baseball is all about intimate ballparks, kind of trying to recreate Wrigley Field or Fenway Park or some of the great historic ballparks. If only the NBA had that attitude, Key Arena might be considered the best gym in the game. Hmm. Careful sports fans, you could be the next Seattle. Uh, the Sonics didn't leave because of apathy. Uh, the grassroots organization Save Our Sonics led the indefatigable Brian Robinson and uh, Steve Pyatt has never given up hope, even when the hope was extremely short supply. Less than three weeks ago, a crowd of more than 2,000 fans gathered in front of the federal courthouse to show, show that uh, Seattleites uh, weren't going to surrender the team without a fight. Are we big enough to support three professional, major professional sports teams? Yes, yes, of course. And the Sonics were the people that took us out of the uh, the days when there was one national sports event a year, the hydroplane races on Lake Washington. And you had the sorehead Lee Chaineth uh, from Detroit, and you had the Gale Boats that always would blame the chop on Lake Washington when he uh, when he lost. The Sonics took us out of that. We were certainly uh, certainly grateful for that. At the same time, however, having a having an active fan organization is only part of the puzzle. You need to uh, you need to have politicians and business leaders showing the capability that they once did, say, in organizing a World's Fair over a bottle of whiskey at the Rainier Club, or that the Seattle City Council of the 1970s had in keeping us out of the whoops four and five nuclear plants and the biggest bond default in uh, in American history. There has to there you know there has to be. Um, I, you know, the word the word leadership is overused, but there has to be a certain amount of, you know, vision, duplicious you know, duplicious behavior, I suppose, in terms of, of uh, hiding your intentions and so on, and the ability to uh, the ability to put things together. And uh, what we saw in terms of trying to save them was uh, was attempting to uh, line up cats. Well, I, I want to come back to the business organizations, uh, whether or not they were appropriately supportive, because I'm going to do a little mea culpa on that one. But I want to continue on with this with this article. Careful sports fans, you could be the next Seattle. Let's go to the first part of this quote. In case you haven't figured it out, the Sonics left because of money. They left because the arena is a small, intimate building with a great sight lines that make it a fabulous place to watch an NBA game. But that's, uh, but it's an arena, not a shopping mall. Interestingly enough, I heard an, an interview this afternoon with uh, uh, one of the uh, Pearl Jam uh, musicians, and he, you know, I was thinking, what in the world does that have to do with anything? But he's a big NBA fan, and he just flat out said, Jeff Ament, probably, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, and he just said that flat out that the the key arena uh, in terms of basketball was ruined essentially for him when the NBA got away from the game and got into doing all sorts of other very noisy things that detracted from the game. Yeah, the pyrotechnics and, and all that stuff got way out of control to the point where, you know, in the, in the NBA playoffs when it's at its most ridiculous, um, it was like a firework show when people start playing and there's a haze over the court in the Boston yeah. Garden. That was really the jump the shark moment for me. But fortunately for Jeff and for real basketball fans, there's still a lot of good basketball in this region, be it the University of Washington, mm -hmm. I hope. Um, maybe eventually even Seattle U, and certainly at the high school level when tomorrow stars are, are playing, minus yeah. all the, the all the hoopla and corruption that goes into the pro game. Got to take a real short break. Uh, every every month right here on Public Exposure, we are very very fortunate to be joined by Joel Conley, a veteran columnist from the PI, and Mike Seeley, the editor of the Weekly. And uh, go to their websites, uh, SeattlePI.com, SeattleWeekly.com. But even better than that, go by the newsstand, pick up a newspaper. You're going to learn an awful lot. Let's continue on. Uh, again, going back to ESPN.com, the Sonic saga ends with a bad message. Very interesting statement from ESPN. The hypocritical Sonics owners argued in court that the team's departure would have no economic impact on Seattle. Wonder how that went over with the voters in Oklahoma City who approved a $121 million sales tax extension to pay for an arena re renovations because they were told it would be an economic boon to the city. Is it a boon to Oklahoma City and means nothing to Seattle? 
Oklahoma City is a plutocracy where a very small group of people still run everything, including one of the worst daily newspapers in the United States. But uh, beyond, um, beyond that, however, I think there are certainly, um, certainly economic benefits to having the Sonics. Um, say I'll City Councilman Nick Lakata can run, run him down all that he could. Um, I noticed crowded restaurants on nights of games. I noticed uh, people, uh, people doing more eating and boozing in the regrade, which is the next closest neighborhood. Um, and I also noted, uh, noted the town Again, as we said earlier, the town coming together when the team was playing exciting, exciting ball and the team was giving us what was Seattle's one world championship. Let's continue on with the Sonic Saga ends with a, with a uh, bad message. And the short summary is that the city and the state did not pay for a new or renovated arena. So that's all the excuse the Sonics owners need to hijack the franchise to their hometown in Oklahoma. Who didn't think that Bennett was going to move it to his hometown when he bought it? Um, Margarita Prentice. You know, she, she really, I mean, I, and you know, I, I like Margarita Prentice. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I've had several conversations with her in the past, but she certainly fell under, you know, Bennett and, and his ownership group's allure and, you know, pushed their cause very aggressively. She was the only one pushing it aggressively in the state legislature. But, um, you know, there was a time where I thought, well, Maybe I mean these guys are good. Sales, I remember right? that time, and you talked about it a lot, right? But here on I this think show. that's just my my own. You know, I, I wanted to delude myself. <laughs> I, I think what was what, what was going on there. I Is that what he was doing? Was he deluding himself? No, there's. I think particularly when we're talking about the home team, people on it, you always want to. Uh, you know, give uh, give people their best intentions. You want to you want to trust them. You want to believe that the city has a good case in court. You um, you want to be optimistic. Um, and I think that was that was the case with uh, with a lot of our with a lot of our elected officials. And the um, and the ultimate situation was by simple sheer toughness and meanness, both the businessmen that bought the team and also their legal counsel in court carried the day. And, you know, as as kind of paltry Bennett's lobbying effort was in Olympia, it was still a whole lot better than Howard Schultz's. Maybe that's <laughs> why I bought into it a little bit. Well, it could have been. Well, Howard's got to close 600 stores now. So uh, let's continue right. on with ESPN. Losing faith in Seattle. Yet another article from ESPN. Uh, and because Seattle, which had already spent a billion dollars on football, baseball, and basketball arenas, didn't immediately agree to spend another half billion dollars to replace a 13-year-old arena, the team left town. And NBA Commissioner David Stern not only uh, let them, he said it was the city's fault for not caring enough. And I want to go to the next graphic because this is actually from the trial itself. Uh, the Field Research Corporation, uh, the president testified and said that after a survey, they said that 58% of the survey respondents in the city of Seattle say that if the Sonics left, it would make no difference to them. That's 58%. 31% said that they would be worse off, and 7% they would be better off if the Sonics left. That's not a ringing endorsement of... The, the Sonics or NBA basketball or whatever it would be. No, but I'd be anxious to see how those numbers would bear out in other cities. I mean, there, there's just going to be a certain percentage of people that don't care about sports, much less basketball. So I'm not, mm -hmm. I guess I'm a little startled that number's over 50%, but not that startled. I think the real number to look at is 31 to 7. And look at the... Um Look at the difference in attitude toward the Seattle Mariners on September 1st, 1995 and October 1st, 1995. Could very well be. Okay, I want to do the mea culpa. Uh, one of the things that uh, I do for the company that I work for is to uh, negotiate, discuss some advertising uh, contracts, especially uh, those related to positive community impact. Um, we work with the Seahawks. We do not work with the Mariners, but that's because of a, a past commercial relationship. Um, when the Sonics called, the young person who was negotiating with us said that what we're doing in our 40th, this was last year, in our 40th anniversary is we're going to bring back some of the great players, you know, and bring them out into the community. Very first one she mentioned was Sean Kemp with nine children from nine different women. That is not exactly the image that the NBA wants to portray. So we're not alone. A lot of businesses wouldn't touch the Sonics because of the NBA. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, there's businesses that, that might have touched the Sonics and Sean Kemp. I mean, yeah. Beer, alcohol. 
Yeah, I know. Um, but again, I mean, I just remember when they announced the all, you know, all 40 year team mm -hmm. at Key Arena, the amount of applause that Sean Kemp got was twice that of any other Sonic, including Gary Payton, including Jack Sigma, everyone. He is the most popular ex Sonic. He sure can dunk Seattle, or could dunk. You know, anyway. absolutely. <laughs> so that you know, Sean Kemp's made a ton of mistakes. You know, not the mm -hmm. least of which was kind of ruining his career. Um, but he remains a tremendously popular figure if you talk to Sonic okay. fans. Let's go from basketball then to the community and winners and losers. Uh, the very first one, Mayor Nichols. Is he a winner or a loser in this? I think very definitely a loser. Somebody who has had his head in the clouds in terms of urban vision. While this was uh, this this thunderstorm was building beneath him, and uh, did not look very good on the uh, stand, and will be forever saddled with the title the mayor that lost the Sonics. However, he was he was sort of the Sonics were going to go one way or the other. I mean, at the end of the lease or or now. Um, he he got financially a reasonably good deal, did he not? I think considering the corner he was backed into, he did all right. Again, like I said before, his problem was he was so ambivalent in the early going here. And then it was only until that it was a very real threat that the team was going that he got off his keister and all of a sudden started waving the Sonic flag, but it was way too late. Winner or loser? Frank Chop. Oh, loser. The, 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 the I'm not biggest, talking about something personal here. The biggest loser. <laughs> the biggest loser. Yeah. So does, does he lose in this? Do the people care? I would, um, the people elect 99 state legislators from around the state of Washington, which means that I don't think, particularly since he generally wins by a margin of about 25,000 to 5,000, mm. that I don't think he's going to be politically damaged. But at the same time, in terms, in terms of responsibility, uh, loser. Seattle City Council, I'm going to lump them all together. First off, is that fair? And secondly, Seattle City Council, winner or loser? Um, you probably, it's probably not fair to lump them all together and probably just to say Nick Licata, loser. You know, if, talk about a poison well. He came out very early on and said this team has no economic impact. I mean, if, you know, if Bennett's uh, doublespeak attorneys needed any validation, there it was long ago. On national television. Let's talk a little bit about the deal. The, the deal includes 45 million cash, 30 million on a couple of contingencies. One of the contingencies is going to the legislature for money, $30 million. And we just had a basketball bouncing off of it. At, at, at a time when the state for, faces a $2.7 billion shortfall. So the, the question is, is in this deal, by sort of conditioning it on the legislature, I mean, What's the legislature thinking right now when they hear about this deal? There's going to be a certain amount of legislators from in and around King County who might make a fairly aggressive push. Ironically, probably maybe more aggressive than you know the last couple stadium efforts. But like Joel said, there's so many legislators in Olympia that just don't give a rip about this. And now that we don't have a basketball team, I don't blame them for not giving a rip. Well, uh, we've got to take another very short break. Joel Conley of the Seattle PI, Mike Seeley of the Seattle Weekly, right here once a month on public exposure. We call it Sound Month in Review. Uh, tonight, we're talking about uh, the big issue of probably a long time, which is the Sonics deal. But more than that, it's the city's deal, it's Washington State's deal. One person I didn't mention, by the way, in terms of a winner and loser is uh, Governor Gregoire, winner or loser. Kind of a, 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 a tepid loser, I'd say. I mean, if, if she's culpable at all, it's that she didn't lead a little more aggressively on this. I'd actually place Ron Sims in the same category. Well, what and, should they have done? I mean, should they have come in and said, you know, yes, we know the public voted against the Mariner Stadium, and we know that it took the most expensive campaign in state history to get the Seahawks Stadium in, and so we're going to lead uh, new funding for an arena that was remodeled 10 years ago? I know. I mean, it, it's ludicrous on, on one level. But on, on another level, I mean, Gregoire could have conceivably had the legislature kick the whole thing to the county council where Sims could have marshaled support there and, you know, gotten the tax taxes he needed to make that whole $300 million picture come together, which, again, might not have saved the team. But, I mean, there were things they could have done. They, they, they could have um, used their bully pulpit. Uh, a little more adroitly, but they didn't. They chose not to lay all their chips on the table, and I don't know if I blame them, but 
Had they really been out in front of it, that's what they would have done. The BIAW already blames, blames her. <laughs> well, there's a strategy you can follow in these things that can be summed up in four words. Create chaos, then conquer. Namely, uh, they could have begun a national blasting away at the NBA using our congressional delegation to do this, um, you know, denounce, denouncing them and so on, while at the same time hinting to the NBA that, uh, you know, we're going to try to get money to, uh, to make some improvements in the stadium if you would just tell these guys from Oklahoma City to stay put. Uh, there's... Um, you can do you can do a certain amount with smoke and mirrors, even if you don't yet have the dollars. And I rather think that Ed Rendell, when he was the mayor of Philadelphia, both dailies in Chicago and so on, would not have let this happen. Well, let's go back to ESPN. The headline of the article is Money Walks, and there's a picture of David Stern and Clay Bennett. David Stern says, uh, in talking about the legislature, he said, given the lead times associated with any franchise acquisition or relocation, and with a construction project as complex as the key arena renovation, let's continue on, authorization of the public funding needs to occur by the end of 2009 in order for there to be any chance for the NBA to return to Seattle within the next five years. So here's David Stern, bigger than Washington State telling us what to do. If they were to promise, I mean promise, an expansion team with that sort of contingency, then that would all be good and well. But all they're really promising is, you know, if a team's for sale, we'll let you know. Maybe we'll have an expansion team in Seattle. But in a previous negotiation, after the uh, Seattle pilots left and, and the, uh, the, uh, the state uh, sued the American League, you had Seattle attorney, later Judge Bill Dwyer, do a devastating cross-examination of the American League's president, Joe Cronin, uh, which backed them up against the wall on their antitrust exemption. And based on that, the American League agreed to sign a new team in Seattle. I think somebody like David Stern, uh, you either have him, have him by the throat or he has you by the throat. And um, he is, uh, he's got his hand up, uh, up in the city right now. Well, if, if Schultz's lawsuit against Bennett actually goes to trial. I mean, that might be the tack that Schultz's attorneys could take. Richard Yarmouth is a strong cross-examiner and I think learned his, uh, learned his uh, legal, uh, legal skills under the tutelage in part of Bill Dwyer. There we go. Yeah. Um, but we need, we need a performance like that. Let's go back to winners and losers. These are two of the big ones in here, Clay Bennett and Howard Schultz. Clay Bennett's a winner. Yeah, for what his purposes were, he's absolutely a winner. He's as big a winner as, as you can be. He's he really overpaid for that team. In Oklahoma. Yeah, he did, but I mean, we'll, we'll see what that team's value is five, ten years from now. I mean, it'll, you know, history's shown it'll go up a good bit. Yeah. How, Howard Schultz. Well, no, let, let's, yeah. let's, let's let him see for a minute. Howard Schultz, winner or loser? I'd say he's a loser. Uh, and he certainly he was a loser, particularly from the night that he was uh, moaning about uh, how he could not get improvements made in the uh, in the um, key arena, even though the improvement, the last set of improvements had stopped, you know, been completed only seven or eight years, uh, seven or eight years before. Mm -hmm. He has not looked good in this, and did not look good as team owner. Is he right? Is Howard Schultz really a loser here? I can't imagine. I think, I think if you open up Webster's Dictionary next year, it might have a picture of him next to the word. But, I, you know, everyone we're talking about here would never have had to play a role in any of this were it not for Schultz hastily and angrily selling the team to a guy from a city that very clearly wanted its own team. End of story. I don't care what sort of little note he put in writing. Howard Schultz... There's most of the blood's on his hands, period. Let's uh, continue on with winners and losers with another click. This is a roster of the Sonics right now. The players, winners, losers. Well, they lose because now they have to sell their $3 million houses for less than what they bought them for. I was reading something on one of the Daily's websites today about P.J. Carlesimo with the $3 million home on Queen Anne. Mm -hmm. He's going to lose money on that. But, no, I think these guys are... are uh, they're not losers in the same sense as we're talking about Howard Schultz and everyone else, but, you know, they put down some roots here. At least some of them did. Kevin Durant sure did, and now he has to pick up stakes mm. and go down south. If they drive through Lewis County smoking dope and exceeding the speed limit en route to Oklahoma City, they'll certainly be losers, like certain <laughs> members of a Portland team. And, of, of course, um, 
what can we what is it uh, is it charitable to wish for a particularly acute tornado season in Oklahoma next spring? <laughs> Winners and losers, let's go to the next one. Uh, this is a uh, face we've seen a lot of, NBA Commissioner David Stern. He's a loser, and he's maybe the most surprising loser to me because, you know, David Stern, over the course of his whole career, has been a very, very good commissioner. I completely just... disagree with you. Oh, about, okay. Uh, well, well, and, I, and I'll give you some reasons why, but maybe not on the show. Let, let me go. explain very briefly. I mean, it was, un it was surprising that he put all his eggs in Clay Bennett's basket like he did. And uh, the guy that won. Yeah. Okay. That, that he did Just leave like himself kind of any wiggle room when push came to shove and ultimately said, yeah, the league does endorse the hijacking of franchises from long-time loyal cities. If I were to give an opinion of David Stern, it would consist of the seven, uh, seven words made famous by George <laughs> Carlin in his comedy routine. All right. Well, let's get rid of David Stern's picture, and let's come into the NBA itself. This is essentially is a representative picture of the NBA. Of course, Seattle Sonics up there in the upper left corner is going to be moving down to the middle of, of that map. Is the NBA a winner here? No. I, you know, in, in you know... That, that's what surprised me at the, just the unanimity of the ownership committee voting to approve the relocation. Mm -hmm. The NBA doesn't gain by moving from Seattle to Oklahoma City, not at all. I want to skip over the next graphic if we could and go to the one after that because I want to continue on with winners and losers. Uh, the winners and losers, the fans, Sonics fans here in Seattle, winners, losers. We have a very, very long fall and winter in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, the Sonics have been um, have been one of the few sources of cheer. Again, again, I can get into uh, Beach and O'Day playing basketball, and I can get into the uh, the revival of the Wazoo uh, program in basketball, and to Gonzaga at least until the first round of the NCAA playoffs. But at the same time, the, the Sonics uh, the Sonics did boost morale. The town really did get into them at times. Um, we have less than a minute left. Now all we have are the jail blo jailblazers down in Portland. Yeah, we have less than a minute left. And the final winner or loser, the city of Seattle's residents. City of Seattle, are we a winner or a loser here? Uh, I think very, very clearly a loser, although 58% of the residents won't care. And even though our, um, some of our dippy uh, Seattle City Council people uh, say don't do anything to save the basketball team but ban plastic bags, uh, we have a council that has an instinct for the capillary. Okay, there you have it. All the answers to all the questions you could possibly have about the Sonics deal was right here tonight on Sound Monthly Review with Joel Conley of the PI, Mike Seeley of the Weekly. We'll see you right here next week on Public Exposure. Take care.